Hello everyone, welcome back to History 1151. In this video, we will discuss the English people's approach to colonization. We are discussing English colonization in a separate video because the English approach to colonization has some important similarities, but also some key differences to other European powers' colonial strategies. Before discussing English colonization, though, we need to get some background out of the way. How historical events in the British Isles would impact England's approach to settlement in the New World. To begin, England was an unlikely colonial power when compared to the other European nations we've discussed previously. Situated further to the north and east of other European nations, England was geographically and culturally isolated from the rest of Europe. English society had been greatly weakened by the bubonic plague as well, which hit the British Isles especially hard, decimating the population. The disease may have killed as much as 60% of England's population. In the aftermath of the Black Death, the English nobility was severely weakened, and serfs, peasants who were bound in the nobility, became free from their feudal obligations. These ex-serfs migrated across the isles, claiming land for themselves and settling in the cities. These migrations helped to inspire the works of English poet Geoffrey Chaucer, as well as other, the proto-reformer John Wycliffe, who produced England's first vernacular Bible in 1381. These migrations even changed how English was spoken, causing the great vowel shift that would give rise to the language used by authors like William Shakespeare. Use of a standardized King's English, also called Modern English, would be critical to the establishment and maintenance of England's overseas colonial empire. Additionally, military events like the disastrous century-long Hundred Years' War with France fought over the succession of the French throne from 1337 to 1453 would take a toll on English society. This conflict ended the same year that Constantinople fell, 1453, by the way. While the English had some important victories in France, especially the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, where lower-class English longbowmen defeated heavily armed French knights, the war was a costly defeat for England. The Hundred Years' War strengthened French national identity and gave France heroic figures like the martyr Saint Joan of Arc. The English, however, were weakened and divided by the Hundred Years' War, as the fighting in France touched off a civil war at home called the War of the Roses. In the War of the Roses, England's royal family, the Plantagenets, were divided between the Red House of Lancaster and the White House of York, as shown by the roses below in the slide. This conflict would not completely end until Henry VII of the Tudor family took control of the English throne after the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485, uniting the houses of Lancaster and York. Henry VII would also be the first English king to commission voyages to explore and claim the New World for England. He funded Giovanni Caboto, better known as John Cabot's expedition to North America in 1497, five years after Columbus's first voyage to the Americas. Cabot explored northern North America around Newfoundland and the Mid-Atlantic being the first European to explore North America since the Vikings in the 1000s. Cabot took three voyages to the Americas, although the English crown did not financially support Cabot in the way that the Spanish supported Columbus's voyages to the New World. Cabot and his men were apprehensive about wandering too far from the coast, and they did not set up permanent settlements in North America although they did leave behind crosses and stone markers called cairns to signify the English claim to the New World. The English, of all the European powers, believed that objects, especially ones that marked out and signified land use, were essential in the claiming of land in the New World. 
It should also be noted that the English at, the, at this time were still Catholic and were trying to respect the Pope's Treaty of Tordesillas, which divided the New World between Catholic European powers. England's loyalty to Catholicism and many aspects of its society would change under the reign of Henry VII's son, the infamous King Henry VIII. Henry VIII was initially a fervent Catholic, persecuting English Protestants and marrying the Catholic princess, Catherine of Aragon, daughter of the Spanish monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, whom we discussed in a previous video. After Catherine failed to produce a male heir, instead giving Henry a daughter, the future Queen Mary I, the king sought to divorce her. The Catholic Church did not grant divorces, only annulments, so Henry was left with the dilemma. The only way that he could have a religious body recognize his divorce, allowing him to have a male heir in the future, would be to establish his own church, one that would be subservient to the monarch. Consequently, Henry issued the Act of Supremacy in 1534, which separated England from the Catholic Church and made Henry VIII both the King of England and Chief Defender of the Faith, or head of the new Church of England. The Church of England granted Henry's divorce of Catherine, after which he married Anne Boleyn, his second wife, mother of future Queen Elizabeth I. Anne, like Catherine, also failed to produce a legitimate male heir. Henry divorced Anne as well and accused her of treason, adultery, and incest in order to defend the separation. These grave charges led to Anne's execution by beheading in 1536. Henry married again, this time to Jane Seymour, who gave him a son, the future King Edward VI. Jane died in 1537 from complications after Edward's birth. Henry married three more times, executing one more of his wives before he died in 1547. In retrospect, Henry was hardly a moral man, but his pragmatic decision to separate England from the Catholic Church would have a tremendous impact on the spiritual, cultural, and political development of the English nation for centuries to come. Henry, once a persecutor of Protestants, turned England to, into a haven for Protestant dis dissidents fleeing persecution in continental Europe. Henry's expulsion of the Catholic Church, the confiscation of church property, and the persecution of recalcitrant Catholic nobles also strengthened the power of the English monarchy in the 1500s. Over a century before the Catholic, French king Louis XIV would distinguish himself with the theory of divine right of kings. Protestantism further weakened the already crumbling English feudal system as well. As church property was divided up between Henry's Protestant supporters and Catholic noble people lost their land. Protestantism's emphasis on education and learning also helped to create a new elite class in the country's urban centers, as commoners began to ascend the social ladder, not through the amassing of noble titles, but through business, education, and accumulation of wealth. This new Protestant mercantile business class of artisans, bankers, and merchants would grow in power and prestige over the next few centuries, it would be critical financial backers of England's colonization of the Americas. England's conversion to Protestantism under Henry VIII gave cohesion to the divided English society, which had been rent asunder by plague and warfare. At the same time, though, England's conversion to Protestantism and Henry VIII's treatment of his first wife undermined England's alliances on the European continent. For years, England's closest ally in Europe had been Spain. The English saw the Spanish as the perfect foil against their ultimate rival, France. Henry's divorce of Catherine angered the Spanish crown. Additionally, Spain began to see England as a heretical foe, no better than the Islamic Ottomans to the east. The Holy Roman Empire also became an enemy of England, as Spain and the empire had united their monarchies under Charles V. In response, England made new alliances with the emerging Protestant powers in the German states, the French Huguenot minority, discussed in a previous video, the Dutch, discussed in a previous video as well, and the Protestant Scandinavian monarchies. 
The Islamic Ottoman Empire was no longer England's primary foe, as the English were more focused on resisting Catholic powers on the European continent. For example, during the Battle of Lepanto in 1571, the English and other Protestant nations did not contribute to a Catholic naval task force that assembled to stop an Ottoman naval invasion of the Western Mediterranean. The Catholic fleet defeated the Ottomans without Protestant assistance due to its adoption of naval technologies that had been pioneered during the exploration and conquest of the Americas. As an aside, the Battle of Lepanto would also help to inspire artists like Miguel de Cervantes, a veteran of the battle and author of Don Quixote, the first Western novel. After Henry VIII's death, his son, Edward VI, became king. Edward, a very sickly young man, died at the age of 15, ruling over only six years, 1547 through 1553. Though young, Edward was a dedicated Protestant and attempted to take the Church of England in a more theologically distinct direction, further separating it from the Catholic Church. He abolished the rules like clerical celibacy and the Mass, and he declared that religious services must be held in English. Having no heir and wanting to keep the country loyal to the Church of England and Protestantism, Edward announced his first cousin, Lady Jane Grey, a Protestant, was to be the next monarch. Jane ruled for only nine days before she was executed by forces loyal to Mary, Henry VIII's daughter of Catherine of Aragon. Mary, like her mother Catherine, was deeply Catholic and sought to return England to Catholicism by violence if necessary. Under Mary, the Inquisition came to England, and Protestants were persecuted, being forced to return to the Catholic Church. Those who refused could face death, even burning at the stake. Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, an important advisor to Edward VI, was burned to death under Queen Mary, or Bloody Mary's rule, as Protestants call her. All in all, Mary had killed over 300 Protestants, high-ranking church officials but also tradesmen, women, and even children who refused to convert to Catholicism were burned during her brief five-year rule of 1553 through 1558. Others died in prison or were hanged as well. After Mary's death, her half-sister Elizabeth, daughter of Henry VIII by Anne Boleyn, became queen. Elizabeth had a long rule as Queen of England, occupying the throne from 1558 to 1603. Elizabeth was a Protestant, but not an especially devout one, having feigned conversion to Catholicism during Mary's rule in order to escape persecution. Nonetheless, Elizabeth reversed the re-Catholicization of England and took the country in a more Protestant direction, strengthening the Church of England. While Elizabeth was a more tolerant monarch than Mary, remaining English Catholics, as well as Protestants who took issue with the Church of England, did face some persecution during her reign. During her tenure as queen, Elizabeth faced several coup attempts against her rule. The most notable, which had support from both the Vatican and Catholic Spain, planned to have her assassinated and replaced with her cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots, who would revert the country back to Catholicism. Elizabeth's rule was vulnerable because of her Protestant faith, but also because of her gender. Many suitors pressed Elizabeth for marriage, including King Philip II of Spain, her sister Mary's widower. Elizabeth refused this match, along with others, fearing that her potential husband would delegate her to the role of consort taking away her power and giving rise to a foreign ruler on the English throne. Consequently, Elizabeth ruled as the quote-unquote virgin queen and declared that she was married to her country. The greatest threat to Elizabeth's rule, as well as England's sovereignty and faith, came during the Anglo-Spanish War of 1585 through 1604. In this conflict, 
Catholic Spain threatened to invade England, remove Elizabeth as monarch, and convert the country back to Catholicism. For years, Protestant English privateers like John Hawkins and Sir Francis Drake had plundered Spanish treasure galleons, seriously cutting into Spain's colonial revenue and undermining the Spanish mercantilist imperial model, which we discussed in a previous video. England was also supporting a Protestant revolt in the Low Countries, also known as the Netherlands, which were at the time controlled by Spain. In 1588, Philip II planned an invasion of England, constructing a massive armada, over 130 ships, carrying 8,000 sailors and 8,000 ground troops to subdue England and restore Catholicism. In response, Elizabeth ordered that all able-bodied English males train with the longbow at least once a week, a precursor to the militias that would be used in England's American colonies. Being poorer than other European nations, the English would rely on longbows rather than gunpowder muskets for emergency use as late as 1598. Elizabeth and her Privy Council also organized their own fleet to counter the Spanish Armada. While the English had more ships than the Spanish, conscripting about 200 vessels, many of the English ships were smaller and lightly armed compared to the Spanish vessels. Contemporary observers expected that the Spanish Armada would easily defeat the English Navy and successfully invade the British Isles. England, led by Sir Francis Drake, engaged the Spanish in the English Channel on July 21, 1588, and used the few long-range artillery pieces they had to bombard Spain's armada from a range which the Spanish could not return fire. On the 27th, the English launched fire ships to keep the main Spanish force from counterattacking. Most importantly, as was critical during the days of sail, an unfavorable wind forced the Spanish to retreat into the North Sea, leaving the English to control the channel, preventing an invasion. Having lost their supplies and the initiative, the Spanish gave up their invasion plan and sailed around Scotland and Ireland, but most of their vessels sank as a result of storms. The English Navy's victory over the Spanish in 1588 was a significant moment in both European and colonial American history. In Europe, Spain's prestige and military might was greatly diminished while well, England's political power and right to practice Protestantism was secured. Additionally, the English victory transformed England into the world's dominant naval power, a title that they would hold well into the 20th century. England's naval power greatly facilitated its colonial ventures. On the high seas connecting the Americas and Europe, with the loss of naval supremacy, Spain's mercantilist imperial system, which depended on the shipping of gold back to Europe, would come under increased pressure from English and other European pirates and privateers due to the loss of the Spanish Armada. The battle between the English Navy and the Spanish Armada was a key moment in world history. It heralded the beginning of the end of Spanish colonial dominance and the rise of England as a new colonial power. Before 1587, England, due to Spain's naval power, had struggled to establish and maintain permanent colonies in North America. Resupplying and reinforcement of the colonies was extremely difficult, as the Spanish had imposed a de facto blockade on England's colonies, and its vessels raided English settlements with impunity. English colonies in Newfoundland, established in 1583, failed. Another colony, called Roanoke, founded in 1585 in what is now North Carolina, proved illusory as well, primarily due to Spanish naval pressure. In addition to resupply challenges, Roanoke failed for other more mysterious reasons, leading scholars to call Roanoke the lost colony. In 1590, an expedition led by John White to resupply Roanoke found that all the colonists had disappeared. There was no sign of a battle or struggle 
Roanoke's palisades were intact, and White's men failed to find any human remains of the colonists. The only clue White had to where the colonists had gone was the word Croatan, carved on the settlement's wall. Croatan was a nearby island that was inhabited by Native Americans. The 100-plus colonists, including Virginia Dare, the first English colonist born in North America, had disappeared without a trace. Centuries later, some scholars think the Roanoke colonists abandoned their settlement and went to live with local Native Americans, although it is unclear whether they left willingly or by force, since Native Americans of the East Coast forcibly adopted rival people into their communities and there had been hostilities between the resident Amerindians of the North Carolina coast and Roanoke's Anglo colonists. Later English explorers tried to investigate the settlers' disappearance, but could never establish what happened to them. The whereabouts and ultimate fate of the Roanoke colonists will probably remain a mystery for many years to come. The first permanent English colony in North America was established at Jamestown in May of 1607. The new colony was erected on the northern bank of the James River in the Chesapeake Bay region of what is now Virginia. The new colony was named after England's current monarch, James I, formerly James VI of Scotland. James was son of Mary, Queen of Scots, who was executed by order of Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth would not live to see a permanent English colony in North America, as she died in 1603, four years before Jamestown's founding. Virginia, England's land claims on the east coast of North America, were named after the deceased queen because she had never married. The Jamestown settlement England's first successful North American colony was established in a manner that was very different from the colonies that other European powers set up in North America. Jamestown especially stood in contrast to the Spanish colonies of North America. In general, Spanish colonies were closely managed from Spain from their establishment. Jamestown was not established as a royal colony. Although the colony had the blessing of King James, and was even named after the monarch, Jamestown was initially funded and ruled by the Virginia Company, a private corporation with individual financial backers. Essentially, the Jamestown colony was crowdfunded. These colonies allowed Englishmen of means to invest in the establishment of colonies in North America in exchange for a share of the profits the colonies would produce. England and its government did not have the kind of economic resources that Spain and France had, so the establishment of private companies, which were funded through investors, allowed the English to establish their own colonies without major government expenditures. The people that would fund these colonies were members of the emerging English professional class. This class's power and wealth increased significantly in the mid-1500s, partially as a result of the English Reformation and the Renaissance that inspired English society during the reign of Elizabeth I, partially as a result of the country's conversion to Protestantism and its victory over the Spanish in the Anglo-Spanish War. Although Jamestown was funded by the English professional elite, it was a different class of people who actually sailed across the sea and built the colony. In general, Jamestown settlers were soldiers, metalsmiths, and landless second and third sons who had no inheritance back in England, at least in the colony's early years. Very few of the English colonists who came to Jamestown were farmers. These initial colonists hoped to find gold in Virginia, just like the Spanish had in Mexico. The first wave of Jamestown colonists were exclusively male as well. The men who established Jamestown, by and large, were not prepared for life in the New World. The colonists lacked agricultural skills, and many of the second sons fancied themselves to be gentlemen, and thus refused to engage in the manual labor that was needed to establish a successful colony. A 
Additionally, the colonists misjudged how the indigenous inhabitants of the Chesapeake would respond to their arrival. They thought that Native Americans would be overwhelmed militarily and could be compelled to offer tribute and manual labor to the English, just as, as it had been done in the plantation system of Ireland. The English had been using the plantation model in Ireland for centuries, and it had been fairly effective even as it stoked resentment amongst the Irish people who saw the English as oppressive foreign conquerors. The Native Americans of the Chesapeake, though smaller in number than the peoples of Mesoamerica, resisted the English. Indians forced to work on the English plantations fled back to their home communities. The Indians, in their counterattacks, even captured Jamestown's leader, John Smith. Wahoon Senekawa, chief of the Powhatan Confederation, one of the most powerful Native American groups in Virginia, prepared to execute Smith, but the intercession of his daughter, Pocahontas, led to the sparing of Smith's life. There's some debate over whether Wahoon Senekawa actually planned to kill Smith, or if the execution was really just a mock ritual to intimidate Smith and force him to give his and Jamestown allegiance to the Powhatan Confederation. As an aside, Pocahontas was probably 11 years old when she encountered John Smith, who was in his late 20s, and there was probably no romance between the two. At this early point as well, it should be noted that Native Americans did not see all Europeans as a single monolith, and Wahoon Senekawa probably thought that the English could be good allies against his own Amerindian enemies. Problems would continue in Jamestown for over a decade after its 1617 founding. Jamestown was built on land that was unoccupied by Native Americans, but the land was swampy and rife with disease, as well as mosquitoes. Diseases like dysentery and typhoid fever were endemic to the region as well. Additionally, the site had very little clean, fresh water, and because it was built on the north bank of the James River, the hot sun, positioned in the northern hemisphere during the summer, heated the river around the settlement, accelerating bacterial growth in the torrid months, exacerbating sickness. Additionally, unbeknownst to the colonists, they had arrived in Virginia during a drought period as well. The land around Jamestown, for the reasons mentioned above, was not good for farming. The colonists, most of whom were not farmers, struggled to grow crops in the new land they now possessed. John Smith, the colony's leader, is reported to have quoted scripture saying that if any would not work, neither should he eat, in order to motivate the lazy colonists who refused to work. Smith's cajoling failed, and the colonists were dependent on resupply ships from Europe as well as on tribute and labor from Native American tribes, leading to friction between these groups. In 1609, John Smith left the colony, having been injured in a gunpowder explosion, and a new wave of migrant settlers, over 200 strong, arrived at Jamestown. The problem was, these new arrivals had lost most of their food and supplies in a hurricane during their trip from England. The colonists who already lived there struggled to feed themselves, and the new colonists who had minimal provisions exacerbated the situation, causing the starving time of 1609 and 1610. During the starving time, over 140 of the 200 plus new arrivals died of starvation, malnutrition, and other diseases. There was also historical and archaeological evidence to suggest that some of the colonists engaged in cannibalism to prevent starvation. Although they consumed the bodies of those who had already died, and those who were found guilty of cannibalism were executed. Additionally, relations with the Indian tribes of the Chesapeake continued to deteriorate. The colonists fought with the Powhatan Confederation, and the fighting only abated 
after the chief's daughter, Pocahontas, discussed earlier, was captured by the English. Over time, though, fortunes would improve for the Jamestown colony, as more immigrant settlers with better skills arrived and as the colonists learned how to effectively farm in Virginia. Notably, in 1613, the Virginia Company changed how land was allotted in the colony. Instead of working the land communally, as had been done since 1607, the colonists now had their own plots to work, with the surviving first colonists being given larger estates to work and new arrivals being awarded smaller plots. These new individual farms and estates were carved out of Powhatan lands as the tribe's numbers declined due to disease and warfare, both against Jamestown and other tribes in the area. Additionally, the rains increased, meaning the colonists had more fresh water with which to grow crops. A year later, in 1614, John Rolfe, a new arrival to Jamestown, raised his first crop of West Indian tobacco in the colony. Native Americans of North America had smoked tobacco for millennia, but English attempts to grow native tobacco commercially had failed because the tobacco was bitter and it had hallucinogenic effects, preventing it from being a marketable good in Europe. West Indian tobacco, however, was much sweeter and did not possess the same psychedelic qualities making it more palatable to European smokers. Most importantly, the imported tobacco, species from Trinidad and the Orinoco region of South America, had a much higher nicotine content, making this Caribbean leaf far more addictive as well. Tobacco growing became so lucrative that the English began to call the plant brown gold after it had been properly dried for shipping back to Europe. The settlers planted tobacco everywhere they could, even on their own doorsteps. The leaf became a form of currency and a valuable commodity, making many in Jamestown very wealthy. Essentially, tobacco for Jamestown and the English was what fur was to the French in their colonies and what gold and silver were to the Spanish in their colonies. Using tobacco became all the rage amongst people in Europe, especially England, where people smoked the tobacco in pipes or inhaled the leaves after they had been ground into a powder called snuff. King James I, for his part, hated tobacco and wrote a polemical treatise called A Counterblast to Tobacco, in which he declared that tobacco was hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, and dangerous to the lungs. Despite the king's condemnation of the plant, Tobacco became the English colonists' first real cash crop. This commodity finally made Jamestown profitable and led to an increase of settlers and migrants coming to the set settlement, hoping to strike it rich growing this plant. Tobacco, though profitable, had some major downsides. In addition to its deleterious health effects, tobacco has no nutritional value for humans. We can't eat it to survive the way we could eat corn or some other crop. Nonetheless, tobacco farmers grew this plant, engaging in monoculture agriculture, stopping the growth of food crops, meaning that the colony, though profitable, was now even more dependent on the mother country than it had been at its beginning. Tobacco also consumes a lot of nutrients, wearing off the soil, forcing the colonists to abandon their depleted fields and expand deeper into the territories of the Powhatan and other tribes, leading to more wars between natives and colonists. Another important deleterious effect that tobacco had on Jamestown was a change the plant made to the colony's labor structure. Tobacco growing, while it does not require many specialized tools, is nonetheless hard work and very labor intensive. The work averse gentlemen and artisans who founded the colony did not want to do this work, but poor, desperate men and women in England were willing to labor in the fields. 
These people were so poor that they had no choice but to sign contracts of indentured servitude in order to cover their sea passage to Virginia. These poor people were facing harsh anti-vagrancy laws in England, laws that made being homeless and unemployed illegal and punishable by hard labor, mutilation, torture, and for repeat offenders, death. Many of these indentured servants had already committed crimes and were offered indentures as a way to escape the hangman's noose, or being broken on the wheel, as seen in this slide. Many young women who had been convicted of prostitution signed indentures, although some were able to reach Virginia if they agreed to become what were essentially mail-order brides for male Virginian settlers. Once they arrived in Virginia, the indentured servants worked for between three and seven years with the agreement that they would be given a parcel of land for their own upon fulfilling the contract, what was called freedom dues. Some indentured servants became apprentices and learned valuable skills like blacksmithing, but most worked in agricultural labor and endured very harsh conditions, long working hours, a lack of food and proper medical care as well. The servants could also have their contracts sold to other masters and punishments included floggings and adding extra years onto their contracts. Masters often sold their indentured servants and the masters would negotiate new labor contracts between each other, extending the servitude of the indentured servants. Literate indentured servants frequently wrote that they regretted their decision to come to Virginia, viewing their indentures as a form of enslavement from which they could not escape. While poor Englishmen suffered in Jamestown, the colony's elite became wealthy through the indentured servants' work and had little incentive to take better care of their charges, as that would mean that their servants would survive their contracts and then they would have to be given freedom dues. The wealthy elite in England also benefited from indentured servitude, seeing the system as the perfect way to remove criminals and poor and homeless people from the British Isles. Contemporaries even remarked that the English upper class used Virginia as a sink onto which they dumped their society's underclass. Poor people from England were not the only people that were brought to labor in Jamestown's tobacco fields. In August of 1619, a Portuguese vessel flying the Dutch flag landed on Old Point Comfort downriver from Jamestown. Unlike previous vessels, which carried colonists and migrants from Europe, this ship brought 20 people from another continent, Africa. These people had not come to the colony of their own volition or under economic duress, but literally in chains. They were slaves. These enslaved people were sold to wealthy planters in and around Jamestown. These enslaved people were probably sold in indenture contracts temporary enslavement after which the slaves would become free people if they survived the indenture, of course. Many of the enslaved Africans brought to Virginia after 1619 survived their contracts, became free, and even gained control of land. Some even took on slaves and indentured servants, both white and black, to work in their lands as well. Early on in Virginia, slavery was primarily not race-based with blacks as slaves and white Europeans as masters, who would then buy and sell African people as if they were property for a lifetime investment. The race-based chattel enslavement that we think of today would not develop in Virginia and the rest of North America until the end of the 1600s. We will discuss what caused this transition in a future video. As time went on, Jamestown grew in size became more socially and economically profitable and politically stable. The colony would continue to have struggles with Native Americans. Two wars, first in 1622 and again in 1644, nearly destroyed the colony as Amerindians band together to push the English out of Virginia, destroying English settlement all the way back to the fortified Jamestown fort. 
They would not be able to wipe out Jamestown completely, though, as the colony had become too strong and profitable. In 1624, the English Crown revoked the Virginia Company's charter, ending a private corporation's management of Jamestown, officially bringing colon the colony under English rule. Ten years later, because of its size, the colony was broken into eight shires, or counties, to make royal administration easier. With the establishment of the Jamestown settlement, the English had entered the colonial game, and had gained a foothold in the New World. Although life was difficult for the colonists, both free and enslaved, and their colony's expansion came at the expense of the region's indigenous people. To conclude, the English approach to colonization was defined by events that occurred in England in the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance. The English conversion to Protestantism helped to make England and Spain early rivals in the Americas, as both colonizers vied for land and resources in the New World. The bubonic plague and subsequent migrations within the British Isles caused the English people to think of land as a resource that ought to be marked out and divided between people, not communally worked, as had been done during the feudal period. English settlers in Jamestown had been far more effective as farmers when they were able to work their own tracks rather than laboring on communally held property. Those who did not possess the land, like Native Americans, had no right to it in the English mind. This approach to land made it easier for the English to dispossess the Powhatan and other Amerindian agriculturalists, since these people did not mark and divide their lands between themselves, instead working communally. The English also drew on their experiences in Ireland in the 1500s as well to create the plantation system in Virginia in 1607, although their attempts to coerce Indians into working for them largely failed. The plantation system bore many similarities to the Spanish Encomienza system, but North America's smaller Native American population meant that the English would have to find other sources of unfree labor. When the settlers' attempts to force Indians to work the land failed, they began to import indentured servants from Europe and eventually African slaves creating over time the race-based chattel slavery system that would dominate the American economy and society. Jamestown was the first permanent English colony in North America. We have focused on this colony in so much detail because it is the most representative of the English colonies. And it will become a baseline for how we consider the other English settlements in North America. As we go forward, I will demonstrate the similarities and differences between Jamestown, Virginia, and the other English colonies, and how these similarities and differences will have a long-term impact on the development of the American civilization.